background, and some ideas about the work you're about to see. I have two very special guests with me today. Uh, directly on my left is someone I have known ever since I first came to the Rep, which was a long time ago. And I think actually Dahan auditioned for the very first show I cast here, The Life and Life of Bumpy Johnson. But Dahan is legendary here in San Diego and at San Diego Repertory Theater. He is a uh, actor, he is a director, he's also a writer. Um, he is the founder and artistic director of Kaumba Fest, which is the most distinguished African-American arts festival in the country. What Dahan does amazingly every February is he gathers the African-American community here at the Lyceum Theater and in the lobby um, for an incredible festival that's not only focused on art, but also focused on using art to help inspire at-risk African-American teens to do well in school and to make life good life choices, and for that are given the opportunity to perform in shows at the Rep. Please welcome to Han Levins. Thank you, thank you. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much. I'm waiting 30 years to do that introduction. Somebody writes that and on to Han's left and my left too is someone who uh, came to San Diego as a stage manager. She'd stage managed in New York and then began to transform to uh, the director she's known as here. She was the uh, artistic associate at San Diego Repertory Theater. In fact, had a desk about 10 feet from my own desk and was casting here and eventually directed here. Her first show that the, she directed here was Proof with Sam Woodhouse is directing the show tonight. But she also directed Intimate Apparel, which is by Lynn Nottage, the playwright whose work Sweat you're going to see tonight, which was, I mean, both those productions were just fantastic. But Intimate Apparel is one of my favorite productions here at the Rep. She went on to found, co found Moxie Theater, directed many plays there, and has won many awards for, from San Diego critics for directing. One of the few directors who can say she's directed at San Diego Rep. La Jolla Playhouse, The Old Globe, and Moxie Theater. Please welcome <laughs> Delicia Turner Sonnenberg. Thank you. The, the topic today is African American theater in San Diego and beyond. And I just want to start with an idea of is the phrase African American theater, is that a useful phrase for us to use for a discussion? What do you think, Tom? I think so. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I broke my mic, it's not on, but you can hear me. Yeah, we have theater voices. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I dropped and now it's... Oh, well, there it is. There you go. Hey, so, there it is. So, Dahan, um, when, when it, what's interesting is that San Diego has a very interesting and kind of rich uh, history of African-American theater here in our city. In fact, you may have seen that there's an actress who walked by us quietly. Uh, she's in the show tonight. Her, her name is Monique Gaffney. And her father, Floyd Gaffney, is probably the leading visionary of African-American theater uh, here in San Diego at his yeah. own theater company here. I was also a professor at UCSD. How do you, how, how do you see uh, the development of African-American theater here in San Diego, Tahan? Well, just to sort of horse you back on uh, the young lady who just walked her, Dr. Gaffney's youngest daughter. Dr. Gaffney was the director of a theater group in San Diego Back then it was called Southeast Community Theater. We all hated the term Southeastern, so it was changed to Common Ground Theater. But Dr. Gaffney approached art, and art was life as far as he was concerned. And so most of the African-American young men that he you know, had an opportunity to work with, he said to use art in order to build character, because character is what will extend your destiny or your faith. And so art wasn't just us you know, learning how to act and get on stage and work out our, our life expressions. Art was to help us self-actualize. And so for somebody to introduce art to us that way, and then we were fresh out of college trying to be counselors and save the world, it gave us an opportunity to take art, to combine the two, and make it part of our lifestyle as far as healing and rebuilding and trying to self-actualize. Um, Dr. Gaffney not only was our teacher, but he ended up becoming like our mentor. If anything was going on in the community that dealt with uh, uh, dispro disproportionate um, monies uh, given to the fourth district for like something higher you, he would have us do plays. He would have us go into the parks and do, you know, you can do five years in a play. 
in 10 minutes. So <laughs> while people were in line or something like that, we would do skits and plays of that nature, built up you know, a lot of fanfare, and then we created our own stage. Everything we did was about entrepreneurialism, it was about civic responsibility. It wasn't just art as far as performing, it was life. And so it became our lifestyles, and here we are now. Talk about the, uh, the way you founded Kumba Fest and, uh, and where it came from. Uh, Kumba Fest is, one of, is a Swahili word, it's one of the seven principles of the Nguzu Saba. Kumba means creativity, but not just creativity, to utilize your creativity to make the situation better than it was than before you inherited it. We, like I said, we had just graduated from school. Our first jobs were working for the San Diego uh, Urban League, and it was right in the community on Market Street. Um, coming out of college, I was 18, but people thought I was like 15, and I'm out there trying to tell people where to go and how to do this, and they were like, who is this young person out there trying to tell us what to do? But as soon as we started to act and take on other characters, people started to get involved. One of the things about being an actor, any character that you play, some of that rubs off on you. So if it's not cool to uh, pull your pants up and speak like you know you got some sense, you can play a character that pulls his pants up and speaks a particular way. And many of the young people, the accolades and the feeling that the vibration that they got from being this respectable young man, even though it was a character, rubbed off on them. And so what we did was challenge them and said, if you can get your grades together, your GPA pulled up, your uh, citizenship, your school attendance pulled up, we'll let you start the same show where Whoopi Goldberg got her start from. Just played on their narcissism and uh, <laughs> it worked in one school and the other principals in San Diego found out about it and so they asked us to involve. After a while, we had the entire San Diego City School District involved in Kumba Fest. We started out as a two-hour show on Monday night, and it ended up being a four-day show, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We were much younger, uh, now we're older. <laughs> now you're like, What's, what happened to that one day? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of young, uh, but just that, the idea of being able to play a character and internalize some of the behavior of that character helped many of our young people be able to develop professional life skills, be able to develop social skills. We're able to develop a character and understand that perception is stronger than reality. And if you can control the perception that you give the world, whether it's for a job interview, a teacher, your parents, whatever, that's uh, what we call behavior modification. And that's really what Kumba Fest is, is behavior modification. I've always been fascinated with Kumba Fest and as the artistic director of the Lipinski Family Jewish Arts Festival, which is 26 years old this year, I actually learned a lot from the Kumba Fest. I had this idea when I was starting that I'd bring in big names and create crowds that way. And uh, I observed and, and, and worked with the Kumba Fest and saw that you're actually focused not on who are the big names that are coming into town, but who in the community you're engaging. Right. And what are the different organizations in the community that you're engaging? How did you come to that clarity? Because I learned from that. Wow. San Diego, for some interesting reason, is full of silos. Um, the African-American community is probably the smallest community in San Diego. So it was kind of bizarre to us how we're like, there's only five of us, and how are there five silos? You know, why can't we bring all of those groups together? San Diego was rich with, uh, like, the fraternities and the sororities and the Jack and Jill organizations and all of these social groups, but most of them never, ever came together. And so what we thought would be, we worked with all of their children, almost any child in San Diego for the past 30 years that is in the arts or modeling or anything that kind of came through us. When they were little, when they were trying to develop that self-esteem to get on stage, they came through us. Our program is free. Our program is at all of the schools. We started San Diego Unified School District and ended up being throughout the San Diego County. So with people being aware of that, they all ended up coming together to see their children perform. So it was like a organic, it was almost, and then once we saw that happen, we said, let's, let's take control of that, let's facilitate it that way. We found out, you know, when does the ski club go skiing? Okay, well, let's not have anything there. We just found out a time where everybody was sort of available and we could all come together and support our children. 
and with that they begin to develop relationships. Kumbafest is really the celebration of the work that we do all year long. So we come here to celebrate, but the work that we do is starts in March and goes all the way to uh, December. Even uh, even our signature piece, the Women of Valor, is based on your signature piece, the Community Jewels. So I just learned so much from from your festival. And, uh, thank you and if that. you haven't been to Kumbafest, it is. Um, it's like a transformation happens over the weekend here at the Rep, and like there's a marketplace. Do you still do marketplace? Yes, yes, the African market. And, and uh, it's like uh, my first Kumba Fest um, and working here at the Rep, it was like walking into work into a transformed space, really. Yeah, and so I would encourage you to, to find out when Kumba Fest is and come. And my, fav my favorite is, um, uh, do you still do hip hop night? I no. Tell me what the activities are now. It's been a little while. Now I gotta come back. Yes, come back and and help yeah. with it. Hip hop <laughs> ended up going gangster. We've been doing this for so long. <laughs> when we started, hip hop was you know the the it. five elements, the writing, the dancing, the those kinds of things. Something happened in the '90s where hip hop flipped, and Kumba Fest is family. It's for the entire yeah. family. So. Can't we have gangster rappers for that six to eight slot? Wait, wait, well, there was a, I was here in 2000. Is there a poetry night? Yes, yes that's what slam, I slam. The slam yes, took the place slam poetry is of, uh, the hip hop. Um, yeah. Friday nights is the night of positive images, and we take the young people that we were in families that we work with all year long and we honor them on stage. There's also something called the Nguzu Saba Awardees, and like we said before, the seven principles. Each one of those principles. Um, is there's a person in our community that represents it, a tangible person that you could actually go to her theater and say, this is Miss Creativity and I wanna be a director so I'm gonna go to Moxie. So we take people like her and other people whose lives represent unity, faith, creativity, self-determination, cooperative economics for entrepreneurs. We, go, we look at all seven of those principles and then we throughout the year try to find people whose lifestyle represents that. Then we honor them on stage in a tangible way. So any young person that wants to be a Delicia can come to Kumba Fest and see her be honored and then walk up to her and shake her hand and say, can I have your card? Where do I meet you at? Where do I watch you at? It's that kind of thing. If we brought people in from New York, you know, a big star, the yeah. kids would not be able to go to their place and look at them and see and say, can I volunteer with you? So it's that kind of thing. We're about uh, community development. Our tag is Kuji Chagulia, which is self-determination. And our goal is to make it to where we can have healthy, active, fit communities, mind, body, and spirit. And the arts is perfect for that. It's, it's amazing that you, you represent that work and have been doing that work here in San Diego and at the Rep for so long. We yeah. just really thank you for that. You. Don't get a chance to say that that often. Um, you, many years ago, talked to me about how African-American theater was changing, and you explained the Chitlin circuit to me, and how work from that was changing. Do you want to give some overview? We're talking about the 60s and the 70s and the kind of work that was, that was being done. How do you see as the sort of, you know, uh, community roots of the African-American theater in America? I'd like for you to go first, as far as Chitlin circuit. <laughs> um, um. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that every culture has this like, I mean, even in Mexico, they're dealing with a big tele, n n the, the tele, telemundo, novella, oh, like Nabella. stars okay. who, and then there's that push for the local theater artists to, um, and I think the, the um, first of all, I want to say, I, I think that there's value in um, any place where people come together and see a live action. So I, I was never like a snob against the Chitlin circuit. And um, uh, and I didn't even really know what that, I mean, because if people are moved, if they come together and they see something and it moves them, then I'm a fan of it because theater is, is art and intellect and heart. And so if, if I am engaged in, in those ways, and sometimes it doesn't, always engage the intellect, right? I mean, there's a lot of like preaching to the choir, but sometimes the choir needs to be inspired. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah. and that comes from, I mean, I'm a slightly different generation than 
to Han, but, and also I am on the other side of when I was younger, I was like, I only want to do professional theater. But now, like my kids are leaving, now I'm like, everything is fine. We're all like, <laughs> we all, like, but just being up here and observing, like thinking about African American theater in San Diego, one of the things, and I think you can hear it from what Dahan is saying, that it is not just about the art of theater, but also how to use the art of theater to engage community, to inspire community, to, and one of my, um, one of my mentors, Ms. Starler, says, um, and, I, and I think this is important for uh, those of you who support theater and those of you who, um, who might run theaters one day, Zoe, um, that um, Ms. Starley says uh, a thing like, before kids can go to like say the Nutcracker and appreciate that, they first need to see themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they first need to see themselves in order to, um, to engage in the art. And that's the, a lot of the work that Dahan is already doing that creates like then theater goers for all kinds of theater, right? Um, and, and something about that like really strikes me. And I, and so moving to San Diego from New York, um, where I was working off Broadway and, um, and even then, even in the 90s off Broadway, that my artistic director said there is like the way you engage, you can't do a, like a one time event for kids with pizza and think that you're gonna have a young audience. It's an ongoing, and I would say the strongest thing about black theater in San Diego is that it is so community based. It is so all about engaging the community where they live. Delisa, you, you've directed A Raisin in the Sun, the cla a classic American play, which is you know, perhaps the classic American, African American play. But you've also done a lot of contemporary work um, and really recent work. How do you see African American dramaturgy and subject matter changing over this 50 and 60 year period? Uh, I, I think that, um, like my kids' generation is totally, like my generation and probably the Hans, we're all like sort of influenced by like, you know, Paul Lawrence Umbard, those Wheatley, the Black Arts Movement, which the Black Arts Movement was the artistic arm of the Black Power Movement. And, and the belief was that the way that African Americans know their history in America is through their artists, through their writers and novelists and playwrights. Um, and out of that tradition also comes Lynn Nottage to a certain extent and August Wilson. And, um, but I think being so many generations now past, like, like my kids have no connection to the South which is really, like it used to be, everybody had people down south. If you're black in America, you have some family down south, right? Um, and and I, we do have family down south, but. Uh, the south is Chula Vista, right? No, right, exactly. They were born and raised Southern Californians. Um, uh, and even though, like, even though I have family still in Atlanta, uh, they haven't spent a lot of time there, and then partly because my uh, my grandmother and my great grandmother have both passed on, and so there's not. So now my mom is the matriarch of the family, and she lives in Texas, and that's different. Even though Texas is southern, so, it's southwest. It's not the deep south, so that's a little bit different. But I would say then, so the playwrights we're writing now, even though th they're. Um, some of them are not as aware of that sort of history, that sort of um, tradition, and writing in the same tradition and, um, that a lot of us were brought up in. And, and I think that that is valid and it's good. And then we run into people like Lonnie Beer. I don't know if you get... Yeah, I know Lonnie. Well, I know you know Lonnie. Well, Lonnie came and challenged us in San Diego, especially the African American Advisory Council. And I have a 501c3 called Urban Warriors, and that's what we do the work all year long. But Lonnie comes from the whole Broadway, Dream Girls, that type of thing. But he challenged us to continue to use the arts to empower the community, but to fill that void that she's saying. There are many people now, if they go see a play and somebody's doing, and 
I can't think of anybody except the big guy. Uh, um, the guy who plays the woman, Mama, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma, ma, Mother Ma-Dier. Dear, Ma uh, Dear. What's his name? Ma-Dier. Tyler, Tyler Perry. Yeah. There are some people when they see a Tyler Perry play, and it's like over exaggerating how people might act down south. And you know, if you don't have real connection to down south, you start to think, oh, that's how it is. And so, <laughs> because you don't have a real big mama to know, that's just a that's a joke. That's a playoff real big ma or ma, ma dear. There are people who don't have any idea about any of those kinds of things. So one of the reasons why Lonnie uh, pushed us so hard not to do any chip and circuit type stuff, because we have a job to educate. Yes. We have a job to say that ma dear is really a queen. She's really an Orisha. She's really uh, the person that you go to when you don't know what to do with the fact that you're pregnant and your parents don't want you to have She's really the therapist that helps us deal with the trauma that we've experienced as black people in this country. Um, you know, we all know about the Maslow theories and those kinds of things. If you do these steps, you can move the. Well, that doesn't exist for black people and people who are oppressed. So, Mother, Ma Dear, and the, 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 the uh, I don't know what we call it, the elders of our families, those guys, oftentimes it would be one person in our family, like you call the matriarch or the patriarch that we would go to for those things. We had fun with them and we ate big meals and things like that, but their purpose was much more vital. It was much richer than what we get in Chitlin Circuit. And, and in Chitlin Circuit is meant for a black audience so that to, for relief of, it's like, oh yeah, I recognize, that reminds me of my great grandmother and those family dinners and that kind of thing. But if you never had that, Right, you and know, you've never had that. If you don't, now you're just sitting at the table with the entire family eating. What are they doing? That must be a joke, because I eat in my bedroom looking at TV, and my sister eats downstairs, and my dad eats whatever. So we were challenged to use the arts to teach life, to teach family, to teach spirituality, to let people know that we're, we're incredibly diverse. You know, there are people who grew up in church all their life, they don't know what oh, who Obatala is. And that it's okay for voodoo to be, you know, for your grandmama to say, I'll cut her uh, stump to fit your rump. <laughs> and for you to understand what that means, you know, as opposed to like, uh, call CPS. So we like to use theater for empowerment, for understanding, but more importantly, insight. Because if you have that insight, you can apply all of those things that comes from our cultures, our lifestyles, and the diversity. Our, there's, black people are really diverse. Right. But you got some black people who only know about black people from TV and social things, and they don't even know how diverse they are. So we like to use theater for all of that. Positive images, positive challenges, spiritual celebrations. What was the purpose of the black church in the beginning? It's way different yeah. than what it is now. Right. So all of those kind of things, we like to use theater to develop insight. And that's why I like the reps so much, because they sound lets us do what we want to do yeah. and grow. So they said, can you tell us about your experience with Lynn Nottage? Now, a, percep- a perception I have of the work that, she, that she's written, partly because of the work that we've done here, is that it's not only about diversity in the African American community, but she's also looking at African American community as it's interacting with other communities. Yeah. That's true in Sweat, in Intimate Apparel, there's this sort of beautiful um, relationship between a Jewish man and, and an African American woman that goes to the play. How, how do you see her particular vision as reflective of African American culture and thought now? And, and, and I, I think that, that Lynn actually serves as a, uh, I talked a, a little bit before about how we're all sort of out of that black arts tradition, but Lynn is sort of a bridge between, actually. I mean, it is sort of some of traditional things that are, not, this is not just, it's exactly what you said, this is not just like the African American experience in America, because August Wilson is already writing that. So this is also like some history and, and how, we, how we are diverse and how we interact with other communities. Absolutely right. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a very, I think it's important um, because like Tafan said, the African American um, uh, African American artists are extremely diverse, obviously. Like one of my favorite 
a saying comes from a, a writer and a thinker, to Ray, if there's like 50 million black people in, in America, then there's 50 million black ways to be black exactly. in America. Because there's something, there's something to be said about shared culture, but then the expression of that culture is oftentimes very individualized. Um, and, and like this, the Han was saying, I mean, if you only see African -Amer pe American people on TV, then you think maybe that that's a, like a very limited like point of view, but in fact it's not. And so Lynn Nottage is like her, she has a big world, she, she, her, as a writer, she has a big palette that she wants to, to think and write about. And how she, and how um, as an African American can, like her culture fits into a wider American narrative. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions after I ask one more question. So if you have something that you want to ask to Han or to Lisa, I hope that you'll, you'll join us for it. So um, what, where do you see African American theater going in the future? And there's now a big change of artistic directors going on in the country. The, the, after uh, so many years, there's a real effort towards diversity in leadership at theaters uh, across the country, uh, country happening now. And also, you're also seeing, I've seen plays changing, that the way stories unfold is being told in a different way. What, what, do, you, what, what do you think the theater in your community is going towards in the future? Well, remember, I'm the revolutionary guy. So I'm constantly pushing people to be more futuristic. I'm like, I want to see a play. Well, we have this group of young people we work with called Project Fate. Um, and in Project Faith this year, we're really trying to recruit young people and push them. Uh, our, the, the three things we say is energy, vibration, and light. And we want your light to represent what futuristic living. Where did you see African American culture in 2050? Um, the movie came out, uh, Wa Wa Black Panther. Black Panther, thank you. <laughs> the movie came out Black Panther. Oh, <laughs> Wakanda, that's what I was trying to say, Wakanda. I'm cool with that. Um, uh, Black Panther, and it was all futuristic. It was like vibranium, that's vibration. It's, so I'm really pushing young people to go that way. I've been able to go see a couple of little short kind of skit things at the um, Elementary Institute of Science, and some of the young people were embracing that, and they're like challenging each other to make applications and all kinds of technology. So I'm hoping that theater begins to prepare us, everybody, for the future. There's a lot of stuff that hasn't changed. There's a lot, and you know, sometimes we try to look the other way not to deal with that. But the arts is an incredible tool to bring that change, even if it just yeah. starts here. So that's what I'm pushing for. I, I, I think, one of the things I think about a lot, especially since I used to run a theater, is how, um, my, my husband works in television and film, and, but he trained in theater as well. But I've been aware for like the last 20 or 25 years, everybody complains about TV, but TV is so much more cutting edge than theater. Like, be, like there was a black president and a woman president on TV way before there was even like black people in leadership in big institutions in theater. American the, Theater, <laughs> women's roles on television, there were kick-ass chicks on TV way before that we were talking about female equity in theater. And so one of the things that I, that I think that young playwrights of color are working on is to, to ch change it quicker, to, to um, make theater more reflective of society quicker so that it can, um, so that it is worthy of people's time and energy, not that, because unlike TV and film, which I, I like, I mean, I'm a theater person, I don't know anything about those mediums, but um, I like the ritual of theater. I like how we all come together and see one story together and share space and breath and have that unique experience that particular night. Like, those are the things that are beautiful about theater. So then how can we use what's powerful about it to also be reflective of not just where we have been, but where we are. And I think that that is where, in, in what I'm reading and seeing, where I feel like young playwrights are. And 
not that Lynn is so young, but I mean like thinking about even even um, this play, which is about the about working class. I haven't seen it. I haven't even read it, but. I'm sure it's, it's a, like a uniquely American story from a uniquely American female point of view because that is what playwrights are doing now and I find that exciting. So uh, can I uh, invite our audience to ask some questions? Yeah, well if you ask I'll repeat it for everybody. I was uh, especially interested in your comments about the chilling circle because I'm not familiar with that. And, and what, what does that mean? Yeah, so the question is, uh, the question is, what does the Chitlin circuit refer to? What does the term mean? Okay, so Chitlins, which I have eaten, uh, so, so slaves had to get like the worst parts of what was left over, and so Chitlins are the intestines of slaves. Uh, uh pigs. <laughs> <laughs> not slaves. <laughs> intestines of pigs which slaves would eat, like clean and cook and eat, and like my grandmother could eat, like cooks some chitlins. I've had them before. I try to give them to my white husband, not so much. But, <laughs> no, they're, I love them. But so the chitlin is not, it's sort of a derogatory, it's like a, um, like haven't we moved past <laughs> the eating the worst part of the pig kind of theater. But what's the, but you, you described like what, what, a, what, who did the shows? Who they were for? What they were like? What were the shows? Well, that like? was just one. That was just one person that I said. But it's the other side of what she said as well. To take something that is the worst of the worst and turn it into something entertaining, turn it into something nutritional, turn it into something entertaining. And so that's sort of like the, the both the sides, yeah, sword. the double edge yes. of the chipping circuit. Um, they didn't have instruments or whatever, so you got to. Uh, a, a scrub board or something like that in order to make the music and you made your own outfits and the things that might make someone else just be devastating they just want to give up life for you would put humor into it the best comedians are people that talk about their pain and the, the incredible journeys that they've been through the chilling circuit sort of a uh, compartmentalized that and took it on the road yeah but so the, the it's big giant black shows um for a black audience that are mainly entertainment. Because no one else is going to get it. So wait, and now yeah. we pay $2.50 a day for chitlins. <laughs> right? Question, was it also that the chitlin circuit also existed because a lot of the theaters were segregated as well? We sure. Just That's why it's a double-edged sword. It's yeah. like, let me make my own thing. And then this yeah. thing is like a big thing. And, and then it, 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 right. So. Yeah. Um, and I also have a question. Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. Um, and uh, I also have a question about Kumba Fest. Can you speak a little bit to the beginnings of Kumba Fest and what kind of like man and woman power kind of had to go into its beginnings and the partnerships that you had to forge? Wow. We keep talking about partnerships. Um, it was sort of like individual partnership. Kumba Fest literally started out as a behavior modification program in San Diego City Schools. There was a, a got horseman middle school. The term back then, at that time in the late 80s was at-risk males. And they were saying that all of these students were going to either be dead or in prison. And we just got fed up. We were like, give them to us. You know, you just don't love them. You can't teach people to love. And this was when the Teach America thing was going on and they had all of these new teachers going into schools, but almost 75% of the teachers in the schools were afraid of the students. You know, they wanted to pat them on the head, they wanted, and the students were like outraged, and many of the parents were outraged as well. We were with an organization called the Urban League at the time, and it was our job to provide advocacy. So that was like the one partner, I can't think of the lady that, well, John was here, it was another John. Uh, was here and we had him come to the Urban League and meet our young people and along with um, the Kumba Fest behavior modification part meaning that if you were a student and your principal said that you were just you know at risk and you were going to be dead you're going to be kicked out those kids would be referred to us from that school 
At the same time, we were already in the schools through a program called Education Now and Babies Later. We use theater for everything. Um, <laughs> the students for Education Now and Babies Later, they were peer educators. So they were already young people. We used role play and theater and all this kind of stuff to teach you know, the objectives for the goals that we had. That was all theater, it was all interacting and role playing. So many of the young people that saw them doing what they were doing said, can I do that? Well, if you can get your GPA together, and if you can this and you can that, sure you can come do it. So it literally started out at one school, 30 kids. Those kids, all 30 of them graduated. All 30 of them pulled their grades up. All of them did it. We rented limousines, had them drop off, and treated them like they were just superstars You know, at their school. When they went to school that Monday, people applauded. The teachers were applauding, well, the students followed with. So it just created this atmosphere of you can use the arts to change. So other schools got involved, and it just really took off from that. It just grew from that. We just have another uh, minute or so if to uh, open the doors of the theater. I just want to ask both of you, what's next? What's your next project you're working on? Uh, uh, I am doing uh, um, uh, two s a workshop and at uh, two workshops at the Globe coming up. One of them will be for the public for the celebration of Juneteenth at uh, 4th District Senior Center. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I am, now that I'm retired from Moxie, I'm spending a lot of time in the community and, <laughs> and doing different things. Um, yeah. So we'll be coming to get her again. Um, I'm working on the best I play. I see that happening. That's yes. so exciting. Do yeah. me? I feel like it on my arms. Yeah. <laughs> it is really fulfilling. I was like, I did, a, I did a gig and I made a shit ton of money. And it was so fun. It was, but it was just the work. And then I did this thing that hardly paid any money, but it like totally changed everybody's lives and worked on it. And I, I am, and, and partly because I'm getting older, I found more fulfillment in that. I mean, not that I don't need money, because of course I do. I have one kid in college and another one about to go to college, but, um, but there's something about, I am right now, as an artist, finding uh, joy in the thing that Dehan has been working on his whole life. Wow. Okay, Dehan, what's next for you? Don't put it off to tomorrow. Whatever the joy in your life that helps people, that helps you affirm humanity, and helps you affirm your humanity, do it now. The play that I'm working on now is one that I wrote for Kumba Fest. It's called Tomorrow Never Comes, and it deals with you know the issues that you know we deal with in the African American community, specifically um, uh, foster care. There's so oh, many yeah. of our kids that are being lost in foster care and they're not enough. I got kids in foster care with the parents don't even speak English. So this play sort of speaks to that. Suicide rate for African American men is at an all time high. Black men didn't usually kill themselves. So it's at an all time high right here in California. So this play speaks to that. I wrote the play, I directed the play, but when I went to see it, I almost started crying. So. I'm like really, really dedicated to that. And so in uh, what is it, May the 26th, we're gonna do it. We did it at Cooper Fest, and we're gonna do it again. And we partnered with the County of San Diego, foster care and all that kinds of stuff for the play on the 26th of May. We've had the wonderful opportunity tonight to uh, hear two people who've contributed so much to our community in San Diego, in arts and culture and in the community. I wanna thank Dahan Blevins, Delisa Turner Sonnenberg. Thank you for being at the rep. Thank you for joining us tonight on Talking Theater with Todd. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again. And, and the play is so May 26th, you guys. Here. Here. On the main stage. Thank you. Thank you.